Hi there, here's Derek Cummings back again with my CRPD video blogs. The idea of these uh, video blogs is educational, to uh, educate particularly people that are newly diagnosed on how you can still live a good life even though you have been diagnosed with CRPD and try to help show people that have CRPD at present, even of the severe range, how you can improve your life and uh, be less disabled than what you are now. I've had uh, COPD for 30 years as you probably know from previous blogs but a, uh, ha because I've been very active and I seem to have done the right things I've managed to get through quite well. The thing is that when I was first diagnosed in 1987 there was no information. I was given uh, an inhaler, told to go on my way. I didn't even know that it was progressive. I knew nothing about COPD. I thought, oh, COPD, what's that? I went. I couldn't find out. There was no internet then days. There was only the Encyclopedia Britannica and doctors in themselves were gods in days. Things have changed. We now have the internet. We can find out lots about what research is going on. And there is a lot going on at the moment. Here in the UK, we've got 1.2 million people that have been diagnosed with COPD. In the United States, there's 11 million people that have been diagnosed, an enormous amount of people, but only two thirds of those that have COPD actually know they have it. So you're talking about maybe 25 million people that have COPD have not yet been diagnosed. Now we're talking about two countries, we're not talking about the rest of the world. So if you talk about the rest of the world, there's an enormous of people that have COPD. Now from that point of view, it's little wonder that uh, governments are put in so much money and so much effort to try and get this resolved, to try and find a better or find a way for us to get uh, cured. Lungs can't be healed, but they can be treated. This is the thing, and this is one reason why it's so important to get an early diagnosis as well. And there's been better diagnosis of COPD uh, over the last decade as uh, an increase of 27%. Now, this isn't because there's more people getting COPD, it's because we've actually found them. There's uh, a lot of research now from the scientific part and the pharmaceutical world are doing a lot of research into finding better drugs to open up the tubes so we actually breathe better. Now, COPD, they say the main cause is smoking. I quite disagree with that. I think pollution is as much to blame. There's a lot of pollution in the world. I wouldn't be surprised in places like Beijing and China, there's an enormous amount of lung illness uh, because uh, it's very bad there. But I know in the case of here in the United Kingdom at London, I've got some very hot spots. In fact, uh, Tower Hamlets in London has the highest incidence of uh, COPD in the south. There's lots of other causes though. There's industrial working, coal mining for instance, working in chemicals uh, and uh, there's also genetics involved as well as childhood illnesses. I myself have got COPD because I had a childhood illness. I had whooping cough when I was only a couple of months old. I was lucky really it could have killed me. Uh, I did survive but unfortunately I'm suffering from it now and I do use oxygen. Uh, not all of the time. I'm using it at the moment because I'm doing a video and I'm up and down and because I'm talking a lot and everything's taking more effort. So it's wise to use the oxygen. Uh, a patient um, will typically go to the doctor when they start getting short of breath. They may be coughing a lot, going up slopes and getting more out of breath than usual and it may start to worry them. They go to see a doctor and what normally happens is they're given a spirometry test. A spirometry test is a very non-invasive uh, test. It's blowing into a tube. You're asked to blow into it as hard as you can and for as long as you can. And uh, It might seem that the nurse is a bit of a bully or the doctor's a bit of a bully boy and you're blowing into it and it's keep going, keep going, keep going until in the end you can't go no more. This gives you 
uh, FEV1, your forced expulsive volume, um, and this indicates whether you if you your lung uh, deterioration, and uh, it will also indicate whether your problem is asthmatic or it's because of COPD. I can't stress enough: if you suspect that you have a problem, go along and have it tested because. Although COPD is not curable, it is treatable and it is progressive but there are ways of slowing the progress down so that it's uh, nearly nothing. Lungs do deteriorate with age uh, naturally. An 80 year old man will find lots of difficulty of getting out of breath and go a lot slower. That's why you quite often see old people going slow, you know, because basically they can't hurry because their lungs, they haven't got the capacity they get. So when they work out your lung age, they work it to your present age. It may be that uh, after you've had a spirometry test, if you're found to have uh, uh, COPD, that you'll be sent along to the hospital for further tests, a full lung function test. I've had it. It does take longer. It doesn't hurt. It's, it's no problem at all. Some have had scans. I haven't had a scan uh, because a scan will show you the type of uh, emphysema, there's something called bulimus emphysema. I don't quite understand what that is. COPD has uh, four, four stages and that's uh, determined by the FEV1. That uh, is in itself determined by the spirometry or a test in the hospital that you go for. And uh, four stages are mild, moderate, severe or very severe. You guys to remember that each one of us, each stage affects us differently. Some worse than others. Some can be in a severe or even very severe and it doesn't seem to affect them much at all and they don't need oxygen. Others, the stage 2 or moderate CRPD, that uh, occurs when you've got an FEV1 of between 50 and 79% of your lung function left. It doesn't mean it have chronic symptoms. It just means that that is what your FEV1 is. Stage 3, that's severe COPD, you'll be determined when you've got an FEV1 of between 30 and 49% of your lung function. Whereas stage 4, very severe COPD, that uh, is when you've got less than 30%. Now, stage 4 is often referred to as end stage. And this is where a lot of people get very, very frightened. End stage to be told, okay, you're end stage, there's nothing more we can do for you, can be very worrying. You think to yourself, that's it, that's the end of my life. It's not actually true. I've been at what you call end stage for quite a few years now. I know other people that have been at end stage for 15 years or more. So don't let that worry you. There are ways of still getting your life on tack and having a good life. Now, to have a good life with this illness, uh, we have to have a changed life. I, my life at one time, I used to do a lot of walking, I used to do a lot of mountain walking, hill climbing, things like that. That's all gone now. So there is a change, but there are still many things you can do. It's not uh, what I can't do, it's what I can do with this illness. So at whatever stage, you must remember, as long as you do not smoke, there's many things you can do to slow down the progression. The blog will, in, will over time explain everything that I've learned. I've, lo I've made mistakes along the way. I will tell you about the mistakes and hopefully you won't repeat them. I also get uh, very many emails from uh, people that have been newly diagnosed from COPD via my written blog at uh, Bits and Bobs co uk stroke copd frightened that uh, the diagnosis means the end of their life no there's no worry for that what you have to remember is that the vast majority of us actually die with copd not because of copd so let me assure you that as long as we make changes to our life we can still live a very long life don't forget i've gone 30 years the vast the aim of this video blog is to show you how you too can lead a good life, uh, even if you're a little breathless. Now, next time uh, I will 
talk about the oximeter and I'm going to talk about oxygen assessments and what dangerous blood oxygen saturation levels will do to us. What oxygen does to help us and how the, uh, the oximeter itself uh, will tell us what's actually going on with our body. And we've been talking about why you're prescribed oxygen as well. So I hope that you've enjoyed this, uh, this little blog. <music>